Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. Welcome back to Southeast Radio's Business Matters with me, Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, last week, Alex Osterwalder discussed the success of his business model canvas strategy tool and the benefits which organisations can derive through its application. In the concluding part of this interview, we'll be finding out how to build the business model of the future. Alex, you've just completed work on your latest book, The Invincible Company. And in the book, you talk extensively about the explore and exploit portfolios. Perhaps you can provide us with an insight into each of these. Oh, absolutely. So I think the challenge is is that most companies, and sometimes even startups and young companies, they focus on exploiting an existing business model, or if you're larger, exploiting existing business models, right? Because if you're Nestle, you have several business models in your portfolio, or Unilever, or uh, Procter & Gamble. Now, what you really need to learn to do today as an established company is not just exploit your existing businesses. You need to be able to do that. You're know, really good at efficiency innovation. You also need to invent the future. That's what we call explore, where it is mentioned, I talked about a little bit before. You need to explore completely new areas to invent the future. And the explore mindset is very different than the exploit mindset. Managing a business, a business model, is different from inventing a business and scaling a business. So what we need today in companies is a dual mindset, a dual culture. We need a culture of exploitation of existing businesses, getting better at doing that. But we also need, and this is not a replacement culture, it's an additional culture, we need an exploration culture. It's what you would find in a startup. That's why we're saying established companies need to kind of create a Silicon Valley within. Now, many companies will say, yeah, yeah, but we do that. We have an incubator, an accelerator. And then I say, well, let's use Steve Wang's words. This is mostly innovation theater. You're not doing this at a strategic level. You're giving a group of young people some money so they can explore and you can tell your shareholders, yeah, yeah, we do some of that innovation. When you get serious about this, you have a CEO who spends 40% or more of his or her time on innovation, managing the exploration of future businesses. Most CEOs today don't do that. Now, one more thing. What's so different about the exploration space? You need to embrace failure. You need to champion failure because exploring new businesses means you're not going to get it right immediately. You need to have hundreds or thousands of failures so you can actually let the winners emerge. And if there's one thing established companies hate, it's failure. Only few companies, and Amazon is definitely at the top for that, embrace failure. So Jeff Bezos, CEO and founder of Amazon, likes to say, you know, you can't invent without failure. It doesn't exist. They're twins. They come together. And what he also says is that the thousands of failures will create the big successes. You cannot create multi-billion dollar successes without exploring many, many, many dead ends. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to waste a million dollar on each project. You will make small investments at the beginning, and the more you see traction, the more you invest. It's a little bit like the venture capital approach. So within companies, you need to have an exploit mindset to run your businesses, and you need to explore new ones where you will apply more of a venture capitalist and entrepreneurial mindset. And when a company starts on their exploration journey, should they be firstly looking at complementary services before they embark on more of a blue ocean approach? So that really depends on the strategy you have. So, you know, the example I mentioned with Ping An, they said, look, um, We believe insurance and banking is going to die. The traditional insurance and banking industry is going to die. Um, We need to become a technology player. So in their case, they boldly went into improving the existing technology plays. So they started building um, um, the infrastructure for other banks. That's one of the plays, which was very close to what they did. But because they were starting to serve other banks, you know, their investments would be spread not just you know, into their portfolio, but across other banks as well. 
But at the same time, they said, no, no, that's not sufficient. We also want to explore other areas, other arenas, because it's not enough to think in terms of industry today. We need to be cross-industry. We want to play in different arenas. That's how they identified the health sector as one of the places they want to play, ultimately also to sell insurance products, but it wouldn't be enough to be an insurance player. So they started to build, you know, their, their different initiatives. Not all of them succeeded. Many of them failed. But that's how, you know, the Good Doctor became the biggest health platform today. So their strategy was to become a tech player, and they invested in other areas. If you take Amazon, you know, they have a couple of initiatives that were, were very close to their core. When they created Amazon Marketplace, they started to offer their own infrastructure to competitors who would sell products that were competing against Amazon products. That was very close to their core, very bold, because they would start to earn money from the infrastructure. At the same time, they went into a completely different arena, which was cloud infrastructure, not for consumers, but for other companies. And they started with internet companies. That is very far out. And then, you know, analysts at the beginning, they hated it. They would say, you're an e-commerce player. Why do you start playing in the infrastructure game? And today they understand that the vision of Amazon was to use the same infrastructure for different arenas, one in e-commerce and one in, you know, the heavy IT, web IT infrastructure. So you need to define the innovation guidelines, the guidelines for your portfolio, where you're going to invest. So I don't think there is a dogma you know, to either play in other industries, to play in the core, to, pay, to play outside. It depends on the context and how ready you are you know, to, to innovate boldly. So what you really need to do is, as a leadership team, define your innovation strategy. What is right for you? What are you willing to invest? What is the risk you're willing to, to, uh, to take? And then enable the teams to play within your innovation guidelines. And in your new book, you mentioned the term driven shifts. What are they and why are they so important? So we, you know, realize that uh, companies still don't understand business models very well. So we created two libraries. We call this a pattern library to help people understand what are the best business models out there. So we almost call it the world's best business models. And there are two types of patterns. One is what we call invent patterns, you know, help you understand how to frame your business model around a product, around a service. For example, I'll give you one or two examples. How do I create switching costs? How do I lock in my customers to make it hard for them to leave, but in a very positive way? That's switching costs. There's one type of pattern, right? Another type of pattern is, well, how do I create recurring revenues? How do I become a revenue differentiator. So we show those kind of business model patterns. But then there's a very exciting new area that we that we uh, went into, which is business model shifts. So I'll give you a couple of examples. How do I meet, move from being a product company towards becoming a service company, where a service is not just an add-on, but it drives your business? There's a couple of wonderful examples here. Hilti is a company that makes light machine tools for builders and they built a service business where it wasn't about selling tools anymore, but it was allowing um, construction companies to rent a fleet of tools, and Hilti would make sure that the right tool was at the right place at the right time. That's one type of shift from product to service. But then there are many other different exciting shifts from sales to platform. Think of the iPhone. You know, they built the platform around a product that they sold. They could have, stick, you know, stayed with the fact that, oh, we're selling a device. We're selling phone. But they turned it into a platform with the App Store, and that's what makes it really hard to disrupt. So there's another kind of shift. Or, you know, a very traditional one, how do we go from low-tech to high-tech? Or more interesting, I like this one a lot, how do we go from high-tech to low-tech? Mm-hmm. Take the Nintendo Wii as my one of my all-time favorite business model innovation examples, the Nintendo Wii, from a technology point of view, is not a very good platform. So when they launched the Nintendo Wii, it was inferior to competitors at the time. But what they figured out is a different business model. 
targeting casual gamers with a fun and simple platform that was based on motion control. So with an inferior technological platform, they built a superior business model from a profit perspective. So think of it. Most people, when you say innovation, they think technology and products, superior technology and products. And here you have a business model innovation that goes from high tech to low tech. Why? Because they figured out how to design a business model around that inferior technological platform. So what we tried to do with this pattern library is inspire people to come up with better business models to shift from expiring business models to more appropriate business models that will keep them ahead of competition. For something totally different now, I'd like to talk to you about Biz for Kids and what you would like to achieve through this initiative. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun question. You know, when, when I was talking to my kids about what I was doing, my daughter was 10 at the time and my son was 13, you know, I tried to explain to them, what's this business model canvas? What's this value proposition canvas? And they immediately got it. We, you know, we did examples that were close to their space at, at, at that time. You know, for my daughter, we worked on a toy store. For my son, we worked on a surf and snowboard shop. They immediately got it. So it made me realize, hey, these tools actually work for kids as well. So I asked them, hey, shouldn't we do an entrepreneurial project together? Let's make a comic book to teach other kids business. Because ultimately, I wanted to spend time with my kids on a fun project. And I thought, you know, how can I better teach them entrepreneurship you know, than doing it? That's the best way to do it. So what we did is we recorded, you know, a session in Berlin where we talked about this idea of making a comic to teach business. We took that video, put it online with a Kickstarter campaign, and we raised uh, 50,000 uh, Swiss francs, you know, equivalent of, uh, of 50,000 euro. And that's how the project started. Ultimately, for me, the goal was to do a project with my kids so they could learn entrepreneurship. But from an impact perspective, obviously, our goal is to teach kids around the world entrepreneurship in a fun way with a fun comic book. And I learned my lesson as well, of course. At the beginning, you know, I was thinking education. My kids said, ah, it's boring. So we really created a cool comic with villains and fights, you know, and and, and the hero, superheroes. So it's a really fun book. And the business education part, you could almost say it's secondary, but it comes across. So that's the Biz for Kids project, which we're in the phase of finalizing. And we're already in the next step, you know, exploring how we can turn this into a curriculum hmm. to bring it into schools across the world. It's a fascinating project, and I wish you continued success with that. Now, finally, Alex, as a renowned strategist, what are your top three strategy tips for business owners? Yeah. So the first one would definitely be don't be happy with success in the sense that you need to stay humble and start to explore while you're successful. And the way you do that is making small bets, many small bets so the big winners can emerge. And it doesn't matter the size of your business exploration is accessible to any size of organization. And the second part here is when you think about innovation, when you think about exploration, don't think about technology only. Actually, innovation is not, you know, innovation is a subset of innovation is technology innovation. The larger one is how do I create value for customers with the right business model? So keep that in mind that exploration could even be based on inferior technology. Remember, Nintendo Mm. Wii. So explore new areas and don't put technology at the center. It can be that technology can be the enabler of a completely new innovation, but it doesn't have to be. And that makes it even more accessible to organizations of any size. And the third one is, Look at this really from a portfolio perspective. You have two portfolios, actually. You have a portfolio of businesses that you're managing. That could be one, that could be two, that could be three businesses or three products, you know, with the right business model around it. But you also need to manage an exploration portfolio. If you're a small organization, you might have four or ten explorations going on with small budgets at the same time. If you're a more established, larger organization, 
you probably need to have 100 projects going on. So if you look at the um, statistics from early stage venture capital, which is a very good proxy, turns out actually that only one out of 250 investments becomes an outlier. So when you're a large established company and you want to build a new, you know, big growth engine, you'd have to invest in at least 250 projects. And that's not multi-million dollar investments when you start out, you know, 5,000 euro or 10,000 euro for a team to explore is sufficient. And then, you know, after a short period of time, after three weeks, you will only invest in those that show traction, that get good customer feedback, etc. So you'll gradually eliminate those that are not promising and the winners will emerge. So biggest lesson for business people today is when we're talking innovation, don't think you can pick the winner. An entire industry, venture capital, can't pick the winners. That's why they invest in a portfolio. Establish companies that want to create new growth and that are investing in exploration need the same mindset. You can't pick the winner, but what you can do is manage a portfolio just like we do in venture capital or like you do, you know, for your personal finances. It's exactly the same approach. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Alex Osterwalder, the creator of the Business Model Canvas, and I would like to thank Alex for sharing his unique strategy insights with us over the past two weeks. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast.